Just recently, Compass Pathways published a press release on their phase 2 trial of psilocybin for treatment-resistant depression. This is the largest randomized controlled double-blinded trial of psilocybin to date. And I'm excited to give my quick thoughts on these results. So stay tuned. Welcome to my channel. My name is Samuel Kohtala. I'm a neuropharmacologist studying the mechanisms of drug action in the brain. Today I'll take a look at the results published by Compass Pathways in a form of a press release, not a research article, and see whether these results warrant the hype the psychedelic industry has recently mustered. This is not peer-reviewed research, but the results are still interesting. So, the study had three groups. One received 25 mg of psilocybin, one group received 10 mg of psilocybin, and the final so-called control or placebo group received 1 mg. The 25 mg dosage group is obviously the one producing the most potent psychedelic effects. The 10 mg group is a little bit more on the mild side, and the 1 mg can be really considered inactive or a control group in this context. Altogether, there were 233 patients, making this a decently powered study. All groups received psychological support from specially trained therapists. The main finding was that the 25mg group, when compared to the 1mg group, showed a statistically significant minus 6.6 .6 point difference on the montgomery Orsberg depression rating scale at week 3. The 25mg group also demonstrated statistical significance on the montgomery Orsberg depression rating scale efficacy endpoint on the day following psilocybin administration. Surprisingly, the 10 mg versus 1 mg comparison did not show statistical significance at the 3 weeks time point, suggesting that the lower doses of psilocybin may not be that effective as the higher 25 mg dose. If you look at remission of depressive symptoms at 3 weeks, twice the number of patients in the 25 mg group showed response and remission compared to the 1 mg group. Sustained response up to week 12 was double in proportion with 20.3% of patients in the 25 mg group versus 10.1% in the 1 mg group. Overall, psilocybin was reported to be well tolerated, with most adverse effects being mild or moderate, most commonly headache, nausea, fatigue and or insomnia. However, 12 patients reported serious adverse events, including things like suicidal behavior, self-injury and suicidal ideation. Now, what do these results actually tell us? First of all, while these results are preliminary and not the actual study, they do point towards psilocybin being a potential treatment for a difficult-to-treat patient population. But I guess the question is, how groundbreaking are these results? Well, the drop in the montgomery Osberg depression rating scale is not that different from many studies of ketamine, but the key difference seems to be that psilocybin may produce more sustained antidepressant responses. That being said, all of the study groups here received psychological support, which is often not the case for ketamine studies. If you look at what Compass Pathways reported in the press release regarding sustained response, meaning that depressive symptoms are still reduced at week 12 according to their criteria, the difference is not all that massive. 20.3% of patients had sustained response compared to 10.1% in the control group. This doesn't mean that these results are not promising. It is important to keep in mind that these patients have tried many different treatment options without much success, and any new treatment that provides benefit is welcome. 
However, one must also keep in mind that when considering a treatment for a large population of patients, the available resources for treatment are often the restricting factor. If there's even a full day of preparation and psychological support, it means that treating one patient binds a significant number of resources, which might not be possible for many healthcare systems. You'd be surprised how little time there is for each individual patient in psychiatric care. But then again, this is a commercial operation and psilocybin therapy could be mainly aimed at wealthy individuals with the money to really afford these treatments. One important issue to address is the discontinuation of antidepressant medication. All patients in this study discontinued their medication, and I don't think we know whether that eventually leads to greater outcomes. My point is that if only a small subset of patients receive benefit from psilocybin therapy, but even that treatment effect is eventually lost, what will happen next? The key questions for future studies to address are the following. How to proceed after a psilocybin session? How sustained are the effects? And is another treatment session effective? And so on. While I can't say that much about the limitations of this study without actually seeing the study details, one issue that comes into mind is the loss of blinding. Compass Pathways didn't report the number of patients that guessed the treatment right, but my estimate would be that majority of the patients guessed the treatment. And that means the blinding was essentially lost. However, the majority of the patients did not have a history with psilocybin, which is good. Nevertheless, the loss of blinding raises the debate about the use of active control groups in the study of profoundly psychoactive drugs. In my opinion, good drugs to compare psilocybin against would be something like midazolam or ketamine. There have also been some interesting uh, perspectives on Twitter about these uh, preliminary results. For example, Dr. Suresh Muthu expressed concern over the high incidence of serious adverse effects, essentially saying, with a 35% response rate and a 5% serious adverse effect rate, then for every seven patients that respond, one will have a serious adverse event, which isn't good at all. And these are valid concerns. Even the press release from Compass Pathways seem to downplay these concerns by saying that suicidal ideation and the other serious adverse effects are relatively common in a treatment-resistant patient population. That is true, but serious adverse events were more frequent in the 25 mg and 10 mg groups than the 1 mg group, raising the question whether this is a drug-induced effect. And to be precise, there was only one serious adverse event in the 1 mg group, while the rest of them occurred in the higher dosage groups. So, the preliminary verdict is that psilocybin indeed seems to have um, antidepressant potential in a treatment-resistant patient population. But it is really too early to say much more without actually seeing the study details. However, many have considered these results disappointing and even concerning in relation to the adverse events. One thing that I think is starting to be clear now is that psilocybin, no matter how promising a treatment it is, is likely to fail the hype and expectations of some psychedelic enthusiasts. But ultimately, only time will tell. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Also, remember to check my other videos related to psilocybin, which I have listed in the description down below. Also, remember to press like and subscribe to my channel for future neuropharmacology content. Thank you for watching and until next time.